In this part, we'll be taking a look at the bokeh lens shader. Let's open up the outputs tab in our render settings and go down to the lenses rollout. And under the bokeh slot, we'll just click on the checker box here and click create redshift bokeh. And that'll create our lens shader globally. So the bokeh lens shader provides focus, blurring, and depth of field controls for our camera. Let's take a look at the bokeh shader attribute. So by default, the bokeh shader is set to derive focus distance from camera. This means that Redshift will use the camera's focal point as the depth of field focal point in our render. So if we select our yellow sphere here and hit F to focus our camera on it, we'll see that now it renders in focus and objects that are further away are blurred. Now, even if we increase the camera distance or rotate the camera around, uh, it still stays in focus uh, because it is still designated as the camera's focal point. Okay, so now if we go back and uncheck derive focus from camera, we'll see that this focus distance parameter will open up. So now instead of using the camera's focal point, uh, we can actually give Redshift a specific distance value to use as our focal point. So our scene units right now is set to centimeters. So um, since this is at 100, it is uh, telling Redshift that our focal point should be about 100 centimeters in front of the camera. And that's about the distance to our yellow sphere. So it stays in focus while our blue sphere over here is now, if we set this value to 250 centimeters, now our focal point is closer to this blue sphere and now it's in focus and we see that our yellow sphere here is slightly out of focus. So those are our two main options for setting our focal distance. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, now let's talk about the COC radius. We'll turn on uh, direct focus distance from camera one more time and focus on our tile here. So the COC radius attributes basically controls how fast uh, our focus falls off into blurriness. So here with our circular confusion set to one, we can see that the focus fall off is relatively gradual from one tile to the next. Now, the higher we set this value, the faster we'll see our focus fall off into blurry. So I'll go ahead and save this render and run another test render with a circle of confusion set to two, and then another one with the circle of confusion set to uh, 0.1 so we can compare uh, how the focus falls off uh, with each different value. Okay, so here are our test renders. So this first one was rendered with a value of 0.1. So we can see that the focus falls off so gradually that we can barely notice any blurring, even in the most distant parts of our frame. And we see a pretty significant difference when we compare it to our original value of one, where we do see a gradual fall off into blurriness. And we see a huge difference when we look at our render with a COC value of two. Uh, here we can see our focus falls off much faster com when compared to the other two. Okay, so that's the circle of confusion. Next, uh, let's take a look at this power parameter. Okay, so pixels that are blurred and out of focus get blurred outwards and gain this uh, sort of soft blurry outer disk. So this power parameter lets us control the balance of intensity between the inner part of the disk and the outer edge. So at one, the power is balanced and we get this even blurring effect. If we set the power to a value of below one, so let's say we set it to 0.5, it means the inner disk gets more intense and the outer uh, disk edge fades so we get a tighter blurring effect sort of like this. Now if we set this to a value over one, it means our outer disk gets more intense, which uh, results in this sort of a uh, double vision effect that we see here. Okay, so that's the power parameter. Next, let's take a look at aspect. So this parameter lets us sort of squash or stretch our blurring effect. So an aspect value of over one will stretch our blurring effect uh, horizontally and an aspect value below one will stretch our blurring effect vertically. And obviously a value of one is neutral and has no effect. So here, if we look at an aspect value of, let's say two, we can see that the blurring effect on our yellow sphere here has sort of stretched horizontally. Now, if we set our aspect to a value below one, let's say 0.5, we can see that now our blurring effect is stretching vertically instead. Okay, now let's take a look at shutter rates. 
So this parameter is referring to the number of blades of a camera aperture. So the blade count actually determines the shape of our camera aperture. Three blades would create a triangle, four blades a uh, square, and uh, six blades a hexagon, and so on. And that shape actually influences how light enters the camera, and it especially affects light from areas that are out of focus. So just as a test, let's set our blade count to three, and we'll crank our circle of confusion way up uh, just to get uh, a much stronger blurring effect. Okay, now if we look at our green sphere and uh, this lamp light here in the back, we can see that they have this uh, sort of triangle shape. And again, that's because that light is entering our camera through a three blade aperture. Okay, and now this blade angle uh, parameter lets us control uh, the rotation. And this is a zero to one value, so uh, if we set it to 0.15, that should rotate our triangles a bit. And now if we were to set our blade count to say four, uh, we should see these shapes turn to uh, adopt a more square look. So there they are. And uh, we can even see it uh, sort of appearing on the highlights of our foreground sphere here. Okay, so that's the shutter blades feature. Now, uh, before we move on, let's quickly switch over to bucket rendering and talk about how to uh, efficiently get clean production quality depth of field effects uh, with unified sampling. So here we've switched over to bucket rendering mode and we have our first test render and of course we have some cleaning up to do. So let's open up our render settings. So the quality and sampling controls for depth of field blurring in Redshift are handled here in the unified sampling rollout. And of course these controls also manage sampling for anti-aliasing and other primary ray functions like motion blur. Those have all been consolidated for us here so it's a nice uh, neat sort of straightforward workflow. So the oversimplified way to put this would be that the higher our unified sampling values here the cleaner our depth of field blurring will look and that's essentially true but of course we want to stay efficient. So here's the simple workflow for quickly cleaning up our depth of field while keeping our render times low. So instead of just cranking up our unified sampling values we want to make sure that our secondary ray samples like reflection and light samples are in a good spot. So first let's disable our depth of field effect by turning off our bokeh shader. And then we'll lock our unified sampling to a really low fixed rate like 4. Now let's take a test render of that. Okay, so we see a good deal of noise showing up in our glossy reflections and in our shadows here. So before all of this was being cleaned up by the anti-aliasing, but let's help it out by cleaning this up with our secondary samples instead. So first we'll up our material glossy samples to clean up our glossy reflections. So here we have our wood material. We can see that in the primary reflection glossy samples, they're set to eight. Let's bump those up to 32. And then we have our portal light here. And we'll up our portal light samples to 128. Okay, and let's take another test render. All right, so those are in a good spot. And we only added about two seconds to our render time. We can see there's a big difference. So now that those are in a good spot, let's enable our bokeh shader again. And let's take another test render. All right, so now we want to start incrementally raising our unified sampling values to start cleaning all of this up. And we want to make sure we're raising our min and max values together. So we're essentially having a fixed sampling rate across our frame. Let's set these to 64 and run another test render. Okay, so it looks cleaner, but uh, definitely still room for improvement. So let's try 128. And now let's try uh, 256. Okay, so that's nice and clean. So now we know that a sample rate of 256 will clean up even our most uh, difficult areas. Now we can drop our min sample rate to something low like um, 16 or 32 or even 64 and do another test run. All right. So now if we compare the two, uh, obviously they're visually almost identical, but we've cut our render time down by about 30%. And of course, if we see some small areas that maybe need a little bit more attention, we can lower our adaptive error threshold to something like 0 0.005, though 0 0.1 should work in most cases. All right, so that's a quick workflow for getting clean production quality depth of field uh, with unified sampling in bucket rendering mode. Okay, so the final feature available in our bokeh lens shader is this use bokeh image function. This function essentially lets us use an image to simulate a chromatic aberration effect in our renders. So chromatic aberration is this sort of rainbow effect that can happen in photographs as light crosses the lens in a real life camera. So let's go ahead and load up an image. 
So here we have this bokeh image balanced. This is included with the tutorial files and it's basically just a 32-bit image of some red, green, and blue circles layered over each other. So let's open it up and let's check out what this looks like with the render. Okay, so this rainbow effect should be somewhat subtle, but we can see it showing up in the out of focus highlights here around our yellow and blue spheres. It's especially noticeable uh, when we compare it to our previous image. And of course, we'll also notice a side effect of this feature is that it's made our overall image significantly darker. Uh, this is to be expected, and it is actually because of the image we use. And in some cases, it is a desirable side effect. But if we wanted to get this chromatic aberration effect without darkening our image, then Redshift has included this unit intensity normalization mode. So let's see how it looks. All right, so now we can see we're still getting our chromatic aberration effect, but without the darkening. All right, now down here we can also see another uh, normalization mode called white color sum. So if we're using a bokeh image that isn't uh, perfectly calibrated between red, green, and blue pixels, then that slight color shift can actually tint the areas of our render uh, that are in focus. And this normalization mode is designed to help neutralize that kind of tinting effect, so we're just getting the chromatic aberration effect with no extra side effects. And of course we can use an image sequence if we wanted to shift the effect across multiple frames. And the last thing to note about this use bouquet feature is that when it is enabled, our shutter blades uh, controls are automatically disabled. We can see they're grayed out up here. Alright, so that's about it for the bouquet lens shader. In the next part we'll be talking about the lens distortion shader.